Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, willkommen, bienvenue, and welcome to this rather lofty titled webinar, Reducing the Levels of Abstraction in Codeless Test Automation to Empower Testing Strategies for Success. I think our marketers had had enough cups of coffee on that morning. My name is Ryan Thornton. I am uh, something in marketing, VP of marketing, to give him my full and, and, and rather pretentious uh, title. And I am joined, ably abetted, by yet another VIP, Mr. James Bent, our engineer without compere. Hello, James. Hello, Ryan. Good to be here again. Looking forward to this one. Yeah, it's a bit of a different one for us, a, a moving direction, though it, it is a, a tried and tested topic that I think uh, people are interested in, uh, but a little bit less virtuoso, uh, a little bit more the state of play in technology in test automation. Uh, don't worry, you'll get your little moment to shine with the demo. So what are we talking about here? Abstraction. So. People can get quite snooty about uh, recorders uh, and, and the term codeless or low code in the idea that they, you know, they're not codeless or, or low code. Don't mind that argument. Uh, but equally, if you aren't writing anything um, other than ones and zeros, uh, you can put an arbitrary line be, uh, behind that to say that you're also not writing in code. There are always levels of abstraction that occur from that most basic and, and, and uh, fundamental of, of ones and zeros. And, and the ones and zeros can do anything. Uh, if you were able to live to be a thousand um, and you didn't have you know, much time pressure on you, you can do anything with them. But we have realized that some sort of levels of, tra of, of abstraction do allow people to go faster uh, and do things, though, inevitably, to a certain extent, they change the versatility, exactly what people can do. Um, so you can think, and we put this down as a as any um, anything that removes you in small or large steps from the code, uh, drag and drop UI, your recorder, which I've already mentioned, or a macro, um, and it, it essentially in coding, it extracts you away from the code. Ultimately, then anything other than a one or zero is a level of abstraction. So if we take kind of the, the recorders that we had, the, the, the test automation revolution in record and replay technology, they still underlying were built on code, even though you were using the mouse and a fancy UI uh, to do it. Um, and varying degrees of success depending what you use and they were bolstered by the use of code and, and if you use them in conjunction with an IDE you could have some great uh, outcomes we're not saying that at all um, abstract me or rather don't so this is kind of covering in a graphic what I've, I've just spoken about and that is you have flexibility and power which you know the the, the the more code you have or the, the more closer you are to that code gives you the greater flexibility and power. However, that is at the cost of speed and accessibility. And equally, if you go for, for, for something like a recorder, your speed uh, and accessibility is increased, um, but inevitably at the loss of flexibility and power. So what we're um, attempting to find um, is a Goldilocks zone. And I suppose the one thing that, that that's not shown on this two-dimensional graphic uh, is another variable, which is time. Of course, nothing is static. Nothing exists in a vacuum. Everything is moving on together. And therefore, where that Goldilocks zone is in terms of the available technology processes and practices, will invariably and inevitably move depending upon what time in history you're looking at. So that's kind of a, to cover where 
the, the, the groundwork and to show some of, of, of what's happened previously and, and possibly why codeless or, or low code has, um, no code has had a, you know, occasionally has been seen as, as, as a dirty word. Because you can have code um, or you can have codeless. But what we at Virtue also, and this is, is, is fundamental to the way in which we see things, um, have, have decided to go on a, a slightly different route to find that Goldilocks zone. Um, we, we mustn't forget you, Goldilocks. Um, and, and nor am I going to have some anecdotal humour around porridge. Um, what we're looking for is something that's not too hot or too cold, but just right, that gives you. Uh, there's a, inevitably, as we've said through the graphics, a trade-off. But if we can do 95% of what you can do with a coded solution, but at greater speed and with you know almost absolute accessibility, 5% is not much to lose, particularly when we will show you that there are some ways in which we can also get you that final 5%, though that will be through some code. I'm not going to, 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 to lie to you. So I've, I've already kind of gone through this. So what we're looking at is, ideally, a programmatic language that is accessible and for all intents and purposes is codeless. Now, I can, I can understand why some may think that this is Orwellian doublespeak. Um, because they do feel like a contradiction. But what has happened, um, I think, to force the ability to, to make this Orwellian doublespeak a reality and not a doublespeak, in fact, but actually something that, that works, um, are two pressures. Uh, and that is the need, the needed speed and scale of delivery in modern SDLC in the age of continuous testing and a shortage of SDETs or, or, or highly qualified SDETs because it's not an, an, a, it's by no means a mean feat to create a coded framework. But the good news is that test automation and its tooling has not, as I said before, existed in a vacuum. We've got advances in AI, machine learning, um, robotic process automation, and uh, this is not neuro-linguistic programming, this is natural language programming, um, which is what we're going to kind of talk about a lot here today and, and have demoed. I've created some next-gen AI augmented test automation tools. I am... Uh, I, I, I do like to kind of uh, occasionally jump on the chat and jump on demos and, and, and speak. And uh, we often get, we've just come to have a look at how test automation has moved on. By it's moved on. Um, and that I think I think it's probably in the last, probably even two years um, is where it's really, really changed. Uh, and kind of codeless test automation doesn't need to be a dirty word anymore. So natural language programming um, is an ontology assisted way of programming in terms of natural language sentences. So it's not to be confused with processing, which will be uh, being able to understand what somebody's saying. This is being able to give commands using natural language. Um, you can, I mean, we think it's much, a little bit more sophisticated, but you can think of this as a keyword, a pre-built keyword driven framework um, it's not a million miles away from that um, but the code for that keyword driven framework is hidden behind a SAS model so the maintenance of that code is is yeah, well, it's not an issue that's why you use SAS um, I'm gonna we're gonna send this out after the uh, the event but you'll be able to uh, read that um, but in real world driver find elements by link text login click becomes drum roll please click login now it's even more 
sophisticated than that because trying to understand which uh, how we select that element and using ai to be able to select that element based upon a uh, a hint such as login um is kind of where we really really get it so it's, it's natural language and ai driven um object identification object recognition i can't think of the others that it's been called uh, in my day Seems too simple, seen it all before, lots of false starts. Um, yeah, we get that. Uh, we understand, um, you know, a series of smoke tests. Yeah, probably you can use codeless for that, as long as it's not too dynamic. Yeah, save you a little bit of time, but anything proper test automation is not going to work. Um, and James in this moment is going to show us, hopefully, um, that actually, you know, really dynamic applications that need to go fast uh, can be for 95 possibly even more uh, percent automated in a codeless manner um, and, and it is because of our ability to train bots based on machine learning algorithms um, and the nlp gives you the best of both world, worlds when you see it in operation it is not a million miles away from code and if one not all applications are built equally and if you don't have the ability to do something one way you've got the ability to attempt to do it another because of all the options that you have open to you it means that you're going to get some really really powerful testing so some semantics which i'm going to send out to you after this but i think it's pretty much time now for me to give way to James and let him get on with the hopefully better demonstration than me waffling on um, of how this works in reality. Over to you, James. No, thanks for that, Ryan. And, and I think this is super interesting because it's what we're going to show is the platform. But I think this is great because it's, you know, it's the positioning of the platform you know you think about horses for courses in terms of how you can utilize virtuoso to be both easy but powerful i think that's the big theme we really want to explore so to that end i'm, I'm going to take you through um I, I like taking people through salesforce just because it's a relatively complex thing to test both because of course it's a very modular data-driven platform so for virtuoso you know we can test not only Salesforce, but any browser-based application. So Salesforce is a, is a really good example of this, not just because of the type of platform, but also because it's incredibly dynamic. You know, every time I load up, for example, let's say an opportunity form on the screen, then typically we find that the IDs are going to be assigned every time I load that, or we see that there are truncated XPaths or iframes without IDs. The point here is that it's actually can be quite tricky to test if you're, you know, reliant on things like selectors, but also just because of things like, you know, where, what we're going to talk about is sort of data driven testing. You know, you actually start to st have to stop and think a little bit more. You know, it's not just this. Let me just record a flow. It's well, actually, I've got to think about things like data environments, but also what we'll talk about is leveraging APIs in your functional UI testing, but all in natural language, a good place for us to start. So I'm going to do a relatively high level sort of view of the platform here. And we have lots of online videos on YouTube, great documentation. So you can, you know, learn, but also reach out to us and we'll be happy to explore any specific use cases. But the fundamentals for us, when we say we're natural language, it literally means if I see on screen that there's a login button then I can write, click on. And then if I see on screen, there's a button called login, I can just write login. I don't need to predefine anything to do that. So I don't need to build that object or model or keyword. It's literally what I see on screen. So if we think about Salesforce, where this is great is, you know, you have your standard objects and your custom objects, as in a lot of applications you do. So actually, you know, this deals with customizations, special elements, you know, basically anything you see on the screen, again, without any pre-setup. And I'll, I'll show you that working in a second. So what you can start doing with our defined syntax, and one of the slides there that Ryan sort of said he'll send out really alludes to the fact that, you know, we have a, a relatively limited array 
of syntax in terms of you know we're not uh, sort of a you know Alexa where we're saying use hundreds and thousands of words. This is our syntax. So predefined key uh, sort of syntax in terms of commands, but actually that covers pretty much what we find most of what you would do in testing for interacting with the user interface. So predefined syntax, it's easy to learn, you can join with, if you like, a hint of what we see on the screen, but also the ability to pass in data. Now, what we like to follow is sort of, you know, some of those testing best practices, as we feel everybody should, and one of them is decoupling the test from data. So instead of here, me writing my actual username into the field, I can use a variable. So I could literally say, let's go in and say, write uh, dollar username, and then look at the screen and it says username. I can put in a variable. And then basically all I have to do is decide before I start creating my test, where's that data going to come from? Now I can set up environments. So for my Salesforce, I could create an environment with my username, password, storing those uh, securely, as well as I've got actually details for APIs here, client IDs, client secrets, endpoints to call. But then I could also be setting up my test data. So creating, in this case, account and opportunity data in variables, which I can be uploading and updating from CSV files to create referenceable test data sets. So this starts to get you thinking, actually, you're already starting to do a relatively smart level of testing in terms of I uh, could be running multiple data scenarios against different environments for things like logging in, uh, opening the dashboard. And in this set test, I'm also going to incorporate some API calls. Because if I step up for a second and look at actually what I'm trying to achieve through my testing objective, it's to update the status of an opportunity. Now, that does not require me to create an opportunity. It's not asking me to do that. Now, in Salesforce, I know that I would need to have an opportunity that's a, that is assigned to an account, maybe with contacts. So there's probably at least three different record types I have to know exist in the environment. But as we know, one of the big issues is test data management when we're managing, uh, you know, running our tests. So what you find is a lot of tests, whether it's I've recorded a flow or I'm coding it, you tend to actually go and say, well, actually, I'm going to come in and in the user interface, I'm going to fill in the account fields with all of these steps. I'm going to fill in the opportunity with all of these steps. You can do that, that with us no problem at all using the natural language approach. But because of our sort of flexibility through the natural language, meaning that I can even do things like execute an API call, for example, which I can have predefined, for instance, my token call, my opportunity calls, I can create those and they almost sit in the background, make sure I got my data mapped in. But then what I can do is sure I could do everything in the UI and it's really quick to do so. But now if I want to, I could start doing functional UI testing, combining UI steps, with API calls. So here I'm making uh, a token call. If I just scroll up, make my token call and return the token, which I've stored into a variable. And now I could create my account using test data, environment data, and that token to create the account, create the opportunity. And then with those minimal steps, then the only things I'm doing in the UI are to actually change the status of the opportunity and to confirm that's being done, as we can see here. So using the natural language approach, you're not limited to, let's say, just recording flows, but equally, I'm not having to drop into code to do this, even though I'm using a programmatic language, you know, English in itself, and particularly when it's used in a syntax form is essentially programmatic. Even to the extent I can, as you can see here, I can be performing inline JavaScript if I wanted to. So I'm joining together two values to create in this case, looking for a stage with expected stage, for example. So bottom line is, you know, you can easily cr start creating tests. And if I sort of show you the experience here for us, when we talk about authoring in natural language, you come in, put in the URL, this has come from the environment to load up a live browser window. And then if I were writing from scratch, for instance, let's go uh, login steps on the webinar. Then as I start writing my test steps, so let's go write, and I know I've got the username in the environment, I look at the screen and it says username. Then as I press uh, enter, there we go, or save, then we run that immediately. We're launching a bot which is looking at the site, discovering that element, 
Again, you don't have to predefine it. And as you can see on the screen, it's written up there. I could come in and let's say add another step, which says write my password again, which is in the environment details in the password field. It runs that boom, it goes in. If I make a mistake, so I could say click on login. Well, or at least I try to. We're going to try and run it, identify it. There's no such element, so it's failed. And now I could simply fix the step, click on the button, it updates it for me and goes to the next point and obviously locks in. We could then map in a sort of a, if you like, a non-functional step in some respects, which is my assertion. So I could say after I log in, I expect to, let's say, look for. So basically assert something exists. And let's say I can see on screen, I don't know, set up home, for example. So I can now be doing what you should be doing and testing is performing some actions and then mapping in some form of assertion to check that you achieve the expected outcome. Now, another really nice thing here is that we build in reusability. So I've just written login steps that are decoupled from data. So they're not specific to any scenario or environment. Yet those are common steps. I want other people to use them. So I could just go ahead and drop those into a library. So let's add those into our checkpoint library. There we go. And now if I were to start a brand new journey again, so let's say test two, I can go to my library checkpoints and say logging in, uh, what do we call it? Login steps webinar, drop those in, boom, there we go. The four steps are immediately put in by this shareable section. So now you're sort of right once, create these reusable segments where they are truly reusable. So now in my Salesforce example, I know that I've created, let's say, go and open the sales module. Then I'm going to go ahead and create my token call. So let's go and run that. I'm going to come in then and create, let's say, my uh, account API call. So you can start seeing by having these reusable segments in natural language where you're decoupling from data in seconds, I'm creating a test that goes in this case and creates an account in Salesforce that I'd be able to use. So that's fantastic. And this is expected because I was trying to close tabs which weren't actually open. So that's fine. That's that's just as the Salesforce instance. But now when I go ahead and create these, if I click on I'm done, behind the scenes, we're going ahead and looking for all of the elements uh, in the DOM and automatically building the structure of that. So for example, to give you just an illustration without using the library checkpoints, if I, let's say, let's go test three in here. And again, I'm gonna go into my login flow. And this is really important for us in terms of how we're using natural language combined with dynamically identifying objects is that we're able to build a model of the element automatically, which I'll show you in just a second. So I'll just write one step here. So for instance, write username in uh, username field. So when that finishes and I click on I'm done in the background, we are then, as we can see here, automatically collecting all the available selectors, X pass and IDs and class names and so on. But then every time we run that test, which I could run it manually, I could create scheduled and orchestrated execution plans. So I could configure out and build basically my, whether it's a regression pack or my UAT pack, I could hook into the CICD tools and run these. But when I do, we will, will be looking every single time we run that test on every version, we'll be looking to see if there are changes in any steps, looking to compare the previous working model with the current model. So here we see SAPS for HANA, for example, where we have a step to click on this CCFU. We've identified using machine learning algorithms, it's the same element on screen, but we can see behind the scenes, we've got a lot of changes occurring in the structure. Now, what we're doing is automatically healing that. So these sticking plasters are auto healing points. Now for us, we've got you know, in excess of 120 plus customers, ranging from small through to enterprise organizations. So we're able to see based on the feedback that this works very successfully. And actually the worst case is someone thinks, well, hang on a minute, what if that goes and identifies all the wrong things? The most likely scenario is if you've literally, you know, let's say removed an element altogether, added it back in with a different label and it's got an entirely different structure, that's going to fail because it's a it's a completely different element, in which case you could actually just come back in and say, well, now I could iterate that test pretty easily. So I could come in and say, well, if I've added in a new test step, let's just go ahead and make a change, insert my new button in here, 
and just modify that test. So you can iterate these out even because I'm not relying on code, I could be doing that before development is even finished if I know that there is going to be a new button, for example. So we've got this means, you know, talking about levels of abstractions. Yes, we are a level away. You know, we're not ones and zeros. We're not writing in code. But we put in a layer above that, which is natural language programming, which still allows you to perform some pretty, you know, smart things with regard to testing. But we've put it enough towards the low code codeless end that you don't need to be necessarily an engineer to be able to do this. So we like to think when we talk about the Goldilocks zone, this is what we're talking about. You know, not too hot. So, you know, not too sort of uh, uh, code based. So you kind of slow down, even though it's powerful, not too cold. If, you know, we call the uh, the codeless, the cold end where you can't really do enough with it. We're trying to you know, yeah, live in that middle uh, ground, if you like. So I think that's all I'm going to really share today, because, you know, in the gist of talking about levels of abstraction, that's where we're thinking from our platform, you know, in terms of where automation is going. And yeah, if you'd like to know more, you can get in touch. But also we do have great reference material on YouTube docs and so on for you to dive deeper. Ryan. Wonderful. Thank you, James. We do have time for maybe one or two questions if anyone would like to ask anything in the Q&A panel. I, I appreciate that it was a, a rather abstracted uh, version of the talk. Um, but as, as James there said, um, please do get in contact if you want to know anything more or would like to see it in action and and you know, use Virtuoso in anger. There is a free trial at virtuoso.qa. Um, and my question here is uh, well it's not a question it's actually just a, a comment and it, it, it says uh, thank you for that I've never thought of um, what is and isn't coding being an arbitrary line and yet it is and moves uh, yeah and I think that's kind of that's that's exactly the point we, we, we'd love to make here um, which the bell does toll for us as we come to the end so thank you for everybody that's watching this webinar will be recorded is being recorded and will be screeching its way through to you via email tomorrow um i thank you all for joining i know that there's a lot of competition for webinars at the moment thank you james for your wonderful as always presentation and uh, i like that little pause point because i will say I appreciate your uh, your uh, slides as well, Ryan. It's a really cool topic. So, yeah, good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I really like this. Uh, it, it's why we exist. It's you know, uh, those great people in devs made a brilliant fundamental decision based upon this way back when. Anyway, let's like not get lost in nostalgia. Um, it just remains for me to say, ciao, ciao for now. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.